alas, time is short, and so, lamentably, we're going to have to rush through several centuries of the Christian Middle Ages, but uh, um, as an example, um, we're going to talk about, again, two figures who stand at the, rough, roughly speaking, at the two extremes of the Middle Ages. Augustine in the 4th and 5th centuries, and Aquinas in the 13th century. So, um, as always, a brief and, brief and superficial presentation, but still. Um, Augustine is a very important uh, um, philosopher of, uh, of early Christianity. And again, to continue this um, discussion of, di of difference between Christianity of Jesus and Christianity in Rome, right? Lamentably, I, I, have to, I have to mention this, right? Augustine uh, um, begins his education as an, as an academic skeptic by reading Cicero, and August, Augustine's mother is a Christian, but he finds the Christian gospel to be, let's say, intellectually unsophisticated. So Augustine cannot really become a Christian before he goes through a stage, he reads Neoplatonists, and only through the prism of Neoplatonists, first and foremost, presumably Plotinus, he then comes to accept the, uh, uh, the Christian doctrine. But a big question, you know, how much does Augustine owe to the Bible and how much does he owe to Plato? Anyway, still, sort of within this uh, uh, broad and superficial comparison, Augustine should remind us of Plato, or at least of a certain Neoplatonic version of Plato, with this insistence that um, politics is a necessary evil. And in general, Augustine's outlook is deeply, deeply pessimistic. Again, this notion that humanity is infected with original sin, with the original sin of Adam. And so human beings are by nature evil. And in fact, uh, Augustine is very adamant that everybody deserves to go to hell because of this original sin. Um, even the saintiest of saints, even the newborn babies deserve to go to hell. And God, only by his infinite mercy, completely undeservedly decides to save uh, uh, certain people. Now, God's reasons are inscrutable to us, so God is just in the end, but uh, uh, we cannot even predict who's going to be saved, because technically speaking, everybody deserves to go to hell, right? And so, again, so original sin, the, e the evil of human nature. And so, Augustine, in a move which is actually reminiscent of the sophists, talks maybe of Thrasymachus, he talks about how there is no justice on this earth, and governments, at best, can resemble a band of robbers. There is, no, there is you know, um, uh, politics is based on coercion, violence, and there is no interesting difference, in principle, between governments and a band of robbers. Both are based on, on, on co coercion. Um, at the same time, um, Augustine, uh, so, I mean, like, in, in general, his general attitude to, to, to life is that this life, again, is a veil of tears or a welter of sorrow. So, uh, um, again, in this anti-political fashion, um, um, Christians have nothing to gain in this life. This, is, this life is only a short preparation for judgment and eternal life after death, which is now understood in terms of, not in terms of the physical resurrection of the body, but in terms of the Neoplatonic immortal soul, uh, um, right? But um, still, to the extent, to the extent, that some people, some Christians, can find themselves in a position of power and authority, um, Christians have to exercise this power and authority in harsh and coercive ways. Again, human beings are bad, and so uh, governments, through harsh, coercive action, have to try to make them less bad. And this is actually, again, and the, Augustine is a deeply, deeply controversial uh, uh, thinker uh, um, throughout the rest of the history of Western philosophy, and especially this idea of original sin, many later philosophers will find this to be a terrible doctrine. And, um, you know, linked to this also is going to be Augustine's attitude towards heretics, because within the Catholic tradition, Augustine uh, um, serves as the most important defender of the practice of violent coercion of heretics. Again, this, this notion that human beings are sinful, so um, even though, technically speaking, people believe with their heart, and um, in, this, in this sense, like, it should be, in, like, it's theoretically, I guess, impossible to force people into the right kind of belief. However, there is a role of, for violence and coercion 
in putting down heresies. And again, this uh, again, Augustine serves as the justification of the centralized imperial power being deployed against um, Christian monasteries or again versions of Christianity which do not subscribe to the Bishop of Rome, to the ideas of the Bishop of Rome who gradually over time acquires the status as the Pope, status which is not really found in early Christian communities or for that matter uh, 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 in the Christian scripture. So maybe to try to illustrate Augustine's position maybe with a slightly more vivid example, so if you talk about tyranny or tyrants, again in general Augustine places, places very low value on this life. And so uh, uh, in principle, again, all power comes from God, we are not supposed to resist evil, so um, and again, all power is from God, so Christians always have to obey. However, if the tyrant forces you to do something completely antithetical to your faith, like for example, um, sacrifice to the pagan deities, which incidentally was the uh, um, original problem that the Roman Empire had with the Christians. Roman Empire in general was very tolerant of many, many different faiths. Again, this idea of syncretism was just add on uh, uh, different gods to the pantheon. However, the Christian refusal to sacrifice to the statue of the emperor, the Christian refusal to sacrifice to the statue of the emperor, this was seen um, as political treason. And this is basically why Christians were persecuted, not necessarily for their religious ideas. So again, so uh, Augustine would say that Christians always have to submit, but if they are forced to do something which is completely against their faith, then um, they can only offer a nonviolent, passive resistance and accept their just punishment. So basically martyrdom. So the answer to the problem of tyranny in Augustine is martyrdom. You accept the death of the martyr and you hope that God will reward you in the afterlife. Again, this is Augustine. And although it's very important that Augustine is not Plato, and I think that there are very, there are very clear uh, differences between Augustinian worldview and Platonic worldview, even if we talk about the um, Republic, right? So um, Plato, or Socrates in Plato's Republic, talks about this intellectual contemplation of the forms and maybe the form of the good, which seems to be impersonal, right? But in, in Augustine, uh, we're, not, we're no longer talking about this form of the good. Now we're talking about a personal God. And so in, in general, there's a basic compatibility between philosophy and religion in Augustine. But Augustine you know, has this very famous phrase, uh, 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 we do philosophy because faith is seeking understanding. But again, again, in the skeptical move, Reason establishes its own boundaries, reason establishes its own limitation, and we have to refer to revelation to supplement reason. So this, this is Augustine. And again, I hope you can see Platonic elements in Augustine's doctrine. So rushing through the centuries, now we get to Aquinas. Uh, um, um, Aristotle's works are actually rediscovered, reintroduced into Europe. Uh, uh, by way of the Islamic world and by way of um, Islamic, Arabic, and Jewish commentators on Aristotle. It's a whole separate story, unfortunately, we have to gloss over. Uh, uh, but again, you can see Aquinas' uh, um, attitude to politics and to life in general is very different, right? So, whereas, again, Augustine in this somewhat platonic fashion talks about politics as necessary evil, Aquinas in Aristotelian fashion is going to say that engaging in politics is integral to human flourishing. So Augustine is deeply anti-political, and in Aquinas we see a certain rehabilitation of political life. This is later going to be important for the Republican tradition. Uh, 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 Republican in the sense of the word Republicanism has different meanings. In this context we mean the value of political, po political participation in and of itself. Um, so, so whereas for Augustine, Augustine has this very radical formulation. He talks about these two cities, the earthly city and the heavenly city. And Augustine basically says, you either have to love God and hate yourself, this notion of original sin, or you have to, if you love yourself, then you have to hate God. Augustine is very uncompromising in this, in this sense. Uh, Aquinas does not see this as a conflict. He's gonna say, um, look, the task of the good life is to be prosperous, including presumably having some measure of property or maybe luxury. So this material prosperity and also virtue and excellence of character and salvation of your soul. And there's, there's a possibility of harmony between all three of these at the same time, right? And in general, 
when Aquinas talks about reason and revelation, Aquinas writes extensively to the Gentiles, mostly meaning uh, uh, Jews and Muslims, but Aquinas imagines, again in this quasi-Aristotelian fashion, which should be reminiscent also of the Stoics, that reason establishes universal norms of morality, that there is a natural law, and this natural law is clear and knowable to all rational human beings, regardless of whether they are Christians or not. And yes, in addition to this natural law, the uh, Yahweh also reveals particular commandments, but first, they do not uh, contradict natural law in any fashion. And in fact, they, they sort of complete and supplement the natural law. But there is a basis for uh, good and harmonious existence for all peoples, in some sense, regardless of whether they are Christians or not. And again, in Aquinas, there's this deep commitment uh, to the fact that the basic truths of life can be established through reason alone, through reason alone. Now, reason alone or philosophy alone will not get you all the way. And in order to be perfectly virtuous, in order to be perfectly happy, and in order to go to paradise or to heaven after you die, you also need the benefit of revelation. But again, uh, um, these, two, these two work much more um, together in, 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 in concert. And again, we asked this question about tyranny and tyrants in Augustine. The only suggestion, the only advice that Augustine gives is accept the death of the martyr. In Aquinas, it's different. In Aquinas, it's different. Aquinas is going to say that the positive laws of society, if they conflict with the natural laws, then they are no, no laws at all. Now, Aquinas doesn't have a fully-fledged political philosophy, but in general, there is something like an intimation to the right of revolution. Now, we have to be careful. Um, this is probably not the right of individuals to resist uh, the governments, right? Because at the, at, the, uh, you know, at the end of the day, all power comes from God. But there's a certain notion that maybe inferior magistrates, inferior magistrates, maybe not private individuals, but let's say princes, can uh, uh, legitimately uh, resist, you know, even violently resist, uh, um, you know, a king who has become a tyrant. Right? So, so, so again, whereas Augustine simply enjoins us to accept our fate, uh, um, Aquinas actually has a, a limited defense of, again, um, right to revolution, violent resistance, overthrow of tyrants. Although, again, although it's not, it's not really perfectly fleshed out. Now, one last thing I want to mention is that you will remember when we talked about Aristotle, there was a typology of regimes. And um, again, I think it's a very interesting intellectual exercise for us to, to look at what was considered the best regime throughout the ages. Now, for Aquinas in the Middle Ages, it's very clear that, of course, the best regime, and again, I, rem I remind you, Aquinas is reading Aristotle and is trying to base his philosophy on Aristotle. Aquinas is going to say that the best regime is monarchy, right? And this sounds preposterous to many students, and Aquinas gives some arguments. He says there's only one god, therefore, uh, there should be one king, uh, 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 right? But I think there's a, there's a deeply, you know, there's a very important intellectual e exercise in us looking at what Aquinas is saying. You know, this should teach us a little bit of humility, right? I, I, I believe, I don't want to say I believe, but I invite you colleagues to think about uh, the medieval prejudice about monarchy being the best form of government, and also to think of what we today think are the best forms of government. Could it be that future generations will regard our political ideas as preposterous, right, as the ideas people had in the Middle Ages. Now, to be perfectly, uh, to be perfectly fair to Aquinas, his um, idea of the virtuous monarchy is actually closer to Aristotle's mixed regime. Aquinas' own example would be Moses, who rules, you know, Moses in the Hebrew Bible, who rules as a single king, but relying on the counsel of the elders. So there is some Mm, some intimation of, you know, separation of powers, or at least something like checks and balances between the monarch, the, uh, uh, you know, the aristocratic, you know, the, the single monarch, the aristocratic assembly of the elders, and then maybe even um, in some form the democratic representation of the people. So not necessarily monarchy uh, in its pure form, but uh, something closer to a mixed regime. Unfortunately, on this note, we're going to have to finish our extremely brief discussion of these uh, uh, two profound thinkers. However, uh, let me just allude to the fact that we're going to return to these ideas, again, this uh, re realist tradition in politics, how human beings are by nature evil in Augustine, and therefore 
society has to be based on a strong course of authority, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. especially in the philosophy of Thomas Hobbes, we'll see something similar. And likewise, a different perspective in Aquinas, especially this notion of natural law, which is knowable through reason and available to all rational human beings. Again, this is an idea we'll re return back to, especially in the, in the works of uh, John Locke, who I think quite explicitly uh, um, borrows many of his ideas from the uh, legacy of Thomas Aquinas.